keep your head down. I'm about to catch some incoming. I'm about to denigrate the 375 H and H Magnum. Stay tuned and see if I survive this episode of Ron Spomer Outdoors. Now, before I stick my foot in it, <laughs> I want to thank our patrons for suggesting this topic and for supporting us. It really helps, guys. We really appreciate it. If you'd like to join our Patreon community, go to patreon.com, Ron Spomer Outdoors, and we'll sign you up. And if you like this channel and like what we're doing here, it would help us a lot. If you would subscribe, we'd appreciate that as well. And if you want more in-depth and detailed reporting on guns and ammo and ballistics and cartridges and loading and gunsmithing and hand loading and everything and anything that has to do with hunting and ammunition and shooting and guns in the outdoors, check out Ron Spomer Outdoors TV. We can do more of that material on there than we can on these public forums. We'd love to have you there as well. Yeah, just check out rsotv.com. And if you can't find it there, go to my website, ronspomeroutdoors.com. And there'll be a spot up on top that says RSOTV. Should take you there. Now, before we dive into the 375 H&H, which many consider the finest all-around big game hunting cartridge in history, <laughs> as long as we're talking about Africa, we will be. Death in the Long Grass by Capstick. Most of us have heard about this book. A lot of guys will get Capstick mixed up with uh, Rourke, Robert Rourke. But uh, this is another good, exciting book about a lot of African safari hunts and lions and leopards and elephants and buffaloes killing people and maiming and whatnot all. You know, they say that Capstick wasn't quite the genuine item. He stole a lot of his stories from other um, PHs he would sit around in the hotels and bars in Nairobi and hear these stories and then relate them later as his own. So I don't, I don't know how much of it's legitimate or not, but it, he's a heck of a writer and it's, and it's an exciting read. So if you want to read an exciting one on Africa, that that's a good one. Death in the Long Grass by Peter Hathaway Capstick. Boy, those guys get some cool names. Now, what about this 375 and why would I denigrate it? <laughs> Life experience mostly. About three years ago, on RonSpomerOutdoors.com, I wrote a blog questioning this famous reputation that the 375 H&H has for just being a hammer, because that's what most guys will say about it. It never fails. You shoot a deer with and he's dead right there. You shoot an elk, and he's pretty close to the same situation. And, of course, in Africa, it's an elephant cartridge, buffalo. Um, I've had guys say they've never not dropped something in its tracks with a 375. So I think, well, okay. Why doesn't that happen to me <laughs> or my friends? And that's why I wrote the article. You can go to ronspomeroutdoors.com and look at it. We'll put a link on here for you so you can find it easily. But I, I was really telling the truth in that. And, you know, it started years ago when I would use the 375 H&H &H and expect what I'd been hearing and not get it and go, well, I probably just didn't put the bullet quite right. Or maybe I was using the wrong bullet or, you know, how you make up excuses. Because surely what I was discovering can't be the reality of the 375 H&H. &H. I mean, that thing is just like right next to godliness, you know. <laughs> but the more of these experiences I had, the more I realized something is not quite adding up here. So I did some digging into ballistics and I compared the 375 to another cartridge that is used quite successfully and popularly for bear hunting in Alaska. And that really got me to thinking. Now, I used this particular rifle and this particular Remington load with a 300 grain A-frame on a bear hunt, big brown bear in Kamchatka. And we are producing an extended video on that hunt on Ron Spomer Outdoors TV. So you can watch it there. You don't actually get to see the video of me taking the bear because there was no videographer there. It was just me, me and the guide, but we'll put up a lot of still photos. So it's sort of like looking at a magazine article, but you know, it did the job that time. Uh, first shot, bear went down. I gave him a finisher, but boy, that was impressive. But then there were all those other uh, hunts and shots that didn't work out so well that I detail in that blog. And just to give you some examples, uh, a reed buck shot through the chest inside of about 125 yards, if I remember right, 
and it dashed off as if it were shot with a 22. You know, it was just the typical, you shoot a white tail and it runs and then it runs out of gas and falls over. This thing didn't act like it had been hit by a hammer at all. Not even a ball peen hammer, <laughs> not even a tack hammer. It just ran. And we thought, well, what would we miss? Shot went right over it. No, it went right through it and it ran off. And then some guys say, well, you were using too hard of a bullet. But then what about the guys who say they only use solids and they kill everything with one shot? Well, that was solid if it didn't open up. I don't know that it didn't open up, but I sure didn't get any kind of a slam, bam, drop right there out of this little, ah, shit, that reed buck might have weighed 130 pounds, maybe 150 at the most. So it's exactly huge. But then my wife used a 375 with a Barnes X bullet on a buffalo, big old mean bull buffalo, right? One shot, down it went. It was not immediately dead, but it couldn't get up. So it surely worked there, and she didn't clip the spine either. This was a really strange one. Uh, then another friend of mine shot our kudu. I do have video of this. I've got to put that video up. Maybe we can slip it in here. Uh, but at any rate, he shot it. Beautiful, perfect shot on the shoulder. And that thing lasted for, if I remember right, I had my video camera going for about a minute and a half. I'll have to check it. But, but it ran off and it stood there and we were waiting for it to fall over and it took that long for that to happen. So what was going on there? And then the same gentleman with the same setup shot a uh, warthog right through the shoulder. And that thing, instead of getting knocked over, jumped up and ran, practically ran us over, ran right up against the tree beside us, you know, and it, that thing's heart was practically shot out of it, didn't slam it to the ground. Now, that didn't necessarily surprise me because I have learned over the years that you don't use a bigger hammer and a slam every animal to the ground with a chest shot. You can talk all you want about energy and power and all the rest of it, but my experience just keeps informing me that the bullet works about like a broadhead. It creates hemorrhaging unless you come close to the central nervous system or directly hit the spine or brain. You cannot depend on a great big bullet to instantly knock an animal down. Shooting game with bullets isn't the same as boxers hitting you with a punch. That's not what it's all about. You know, a punch to the head that knocks you out. Is that the power that did it or is it hitting the brain and the spine and the central nervous system? Jolting that. I think that's what's going on. But at any rate, I got to worrying about that 375 and is it really all it was uh, built up to be. So when I did my comparisons against the popular alternative up in Alaska, it's the 338 Winchester Magnum. And that is the comparison I want to make ballistically today. Now you can tell all the stories you want and the anecdotes and relate what happened to you and your Uncle Jim and the uh, outfitter who got eaten by the bear when he used too small of a cartridge and bullet. But... The fact that a lot of outfitters in Alaska, and as I've heard it, more of them now are preferring the 338 Win Mag as their backup rifle or their do-it-all rifle than the 375. And as I recall, back in the 60s and 70s, the 375 was sort of the ultimate brown bear, grizzly bear rifle in Alaska, even if it was just for protection, uh, for hunting, certainly. But of course, hunters were using all kinds of bullets and cartridges. Jack O'Connor took bears. I think he took a brown bear with his 270. And a lot of folks have taken grizzly bears with uh, 270s and 30 on sixes and who knows what all. So, uh, but still, if you're a guide, an outfitter, and you have to protect your clients, you're going to have to have what you would consider to be a stopping rifle. And I don't necessarily believe on those either, but no one in his right mind would take a 22 as a stopping rifle. A four, a 470 Nitro Express might not automatically stop everything either, but you've got a lot of better chance with that than you do with a lighter bullet and a lighter caliber. But the 338 is obviously a narrower bullet than the 375. You got a, a 33, 338 versus a 375, 0.375 diameter bullet on a 375. So those, those are your differences, but What's this guy? This is supposed to be in here. Oh, that's that one. I want to tell you about this guy later. This is the one we have to have in the lineup, the other 375. Now, as you'll note, the 375 has a belt. This was the second belted case ever made, but the one that was the most famous. 1911, I think, H&H, &H, Holland and Holland in England came up with this. 
And as you can see, it does not have much of a shoulder on it. So they didn't think it was going to headspace, which means stopping in the chamber off of that little bit of a bump there on the shoulder. So they didn't want to have a rimmed case because they wanted to run this in a bolt action rifle. And you put a big rim on the back, like on a 3030, and it gets in the way and the magazines don't work all that well. Stacked magazines. That's why 3030s are generally in a long tubular magazine rather than a vertical stack magazine. So they put this rim around the head. That's the belt. It has nothing to do with increasing the, the power or holding the power in and strengthening the case. It's just for head spacing. There's a little mirrored surface inside the chamber on which this lip hits, and that stops it. So there's your head spacing. But it became famous as the big belted magnum. Hoo-hoo! <laughs> and, of course, Roy Weatherby grabbed a hold of it, started making cartridges out of it that were necked way down so he could get more velocity out of those. And that's when the big velocity um, trend started back in the 40s. He actually started that stuff. Winchester and Remington started picking them up in the late 50s and into the 60s. And that's when we got our famous belted cartridges, one of which was the 338 Winchester Magnum. In fact, that one came out before the 300 Win Mag. It came out before the 7 Rem Mag. 1958, I believe, is when Winchester came out with that. But being a 33 caliber, it wasn't a big, wild success. Because once the average deer hunter gets up to 30 caliber, you figure you're done. What else do you need? And there were a lot more deer hunters around in the 50s than there were elk hunters and moose hunters. But it was a heck of a cartridge and it stayed around because of that. And it gained momentum over the years until now, like I said, it's kind of the most popular in Alaska for bear hunting, moose hunting, anything big. It's got the ability to reach and shoot pretty fast flat and far, but it also is pretty powerful for doing that stopping rifle stuff when Mr. Bear is coming at you faster than you'd like him to. <laughs> so as you can see, when we slide this up against that famous belted 375 H&H case, you'll notice it looks about the same except for it's shorter. And that is exactly what it is. Winchester took either the 375 case or maybe the 300 H&H Magnum, which was just a neck down version of the 375, and they molded it into the 338 Win Mag. All of the Win Mags on that belt were shortened so that they would fit in Winchester's Model 70 standard length action rifles, the same ones they were using for the 270s and the 30 out sixes. So that made a relatively affordable rifle for folks who could have then a bigger cartridge that was mimicking the super magnums, the real full length magnums for which you needed a pretty expensive rifle with a longer action. That's why they became so popular. So here's the 338. What does it shoot? Well, it'll shoot bullets up to about 250 grains, although you can find some 300 grainers and load it in it. Not very common, but it can be done. I think it's probably optimal with a 250 grain bullet. Whereas the 375, you're usually talking about a 250 grain bullet on up to a 300 grain bullet. And I'm sure there are a few heavier ones, but generally the 375 folks are shooting a 300 grain bullet unless they want something lighter for planes game, kudu, oryx, all of those sized animals and probably elk over here. Um, but if we consider the 300 sort of the optimum stopper on the 375 against the 250 and the 338, I think we come up with some pretty fair comparisons. And there's where we go to the tail of the tape again. And we'll put the charts up for you guys. We are going to compare the 300 grain bullet in a 375 at 2,550 feet per second. Now, some reloading manuals will suggest 2,600 feet per second. Um, but generally with factory loads, you're lucky to get 25. That's kind of a standard. So I sort of split the difference here. I think this is pretty realistic. In the 338 Win Mag, I saw some reloading manuals lifting that 250 grain bullet at 2750, I believe. Um, and some of them are as low as 2600. So I thought hmm, 2700 seems pretty reasonable there. But do be aware that not every load is going to shoot to the same velocities. But this is a pretty fair comparison. So what we're going to do is set these up for a maximum point blank range zero on a six inch target. And to do that, we will zero the 375 load at 210 yards and the 338 wind mag load will be at 225 yards. So you see you're getting a little bit extra reach already with that bullet because it's lighter and it's faster. So 
Now let's look down at the feet per second. This is your muzzle velocity. It's in red, 2,550 feet per second for the 375, 2,700 for the 338 wind mag. And that gives us a muzzle energy, and that's right below in red, 4,332 feet per second out of the 375, 4,047 feet per second out of the 338 wind mag. So obviously this guy's got more punch. Is he going to make a difference? And is it going to last? That's the big question. And that's where we go to our trajectory downrange. Under the 50-yard column, 50 yards, drop, drift, energy. Drops 1.3 inches. It drifts in a 10-mile-an-hour right-angle wind just 0.2 inches. Nothing to worry about. And it still has 3,892 foot-pounds of energy. That's the 375 H&H. And oh, by the way, the bullet I used on that to get the BC of 0.325, that is a swift A-frame. And that's what I used on the bear in this rifle on that Kamchatka hunt. So I stuck with the A-frame on the 338 as well. And that's where I got the BC of 0.425. Notice those two numbers. The higher BC on the 338 suggests it's going to retain more energy. That means it's going to shoot flatter, drift less, <laughs> and probably retain more energy. But can it keep up with the higher energy that the 375 starts out with? Let's go out to 125 yards. Look at the second column over on the drop drifts and energies. And we see that we're dropping three inches for both of them. The uh, wind deflection, 1.9 on the 375, 1.3 on the 338. No big deal there. But look at the energies. 3,298 out of the 375 H&H, &H, 3,308 out of the little 338 wind. 125 yards and the Winchester has already exceeded the remaining energy of the 375 H&H. &H. Is that a big deal? No, I don't think so. But it is a deal and it is something worth considering. Now, most folks who are thinking of stopping a charging brown bear are probably thinking inside of 50 yards, or at least inside of 100 yards, in which case the 375 is the winner. But then a lot of guys think, if I'm going to be up in bear country, I want to protect myself, but I also want to be hunting. And I don't necessarily want to be hunting bear. I might hunt caribou or moose or even sheep up in Alaska, mountain goats. I mean, there's a lot of things to hunt that don't require big 375 H&H &H and 300 grain bullets. So maybe the 338 would be a reasonable option. What do you gain from it? A little bit shorter light, a rifle, a little bit lighter rifle, and maybe a little bit less recoil. Let's look at the recoil under that first column where we're talking, uh, listing all of the features on these cartridges. I've got recoil toward the bottom. On the 375 in a nine pound rifle, 41.9 foot pounds of punch coming back at you at 17 feet per second. Compare that to the 338. 36.4 foot-pounds of energy at 15.9 feet per second, less recoil. Whether it's enough that you're going to really appreciate it, I don't know, it's up to you, but it is something to consider. And I think all of this adds up to why so many are preferring that 338 wind mag over the 375. You get a cheaper rifle because you don't have to have that full magnum length action. You get a little bit lighter weight rifle and you've got less recoil and flatter trajectories, a little bit less wind deflection. And another thing to consider is the sectional density. A lot of folks who are concerned about big dangerous game and bullets penetrating adequately really like to look at the sectional density numbers. And the longer the bullet is for its diameter and weight, the higher its sectional density. As a result, the sectional density of this A-frame bullet 300 in a 375 is 0.305. And the sectional density in the 338 Win Mag with the same A-frame bullet, but in a 250 grain 33 caliber bullet, 0.313. Little bit higher sectional density rating. So that suggests it might penetrate a little bit better. You mix in the higher SD with the higher downrange energies, I can see why that 338 is a winner. So, does that mean a 375 is no good? Well, of course not. I mean, the reason it has its reputation is because it's proven itself for decades, since 1911. And it is, in Africa, considered the starting point for dangerous game. 
especially elephant. I'm not sure if in some places you can hunt. Yeah, you probably can hunt buffalo legally with smaller. I know several countries have allowed sort of grandfathered in the 9.3 by 62 cartridge from Germany because it's been so successful for so long. But other than that, I think you've got to step up to the 375. So if you're thinking of Africa buffalo hunt, you're probably not going to use the 338 because it's not legal. So there's where your 375 is definitely winning out. But if you're going to use that 375 over there and you're going to hunt in addition to a buffalo, you're probably going to take a bunch of planes game. So you can take an extra rifle along, which is kind of a pain in the butt because you've got to drag another rifle around. And most countries are going to make you pay for that rifle. You have to have some kind of a tax. Every time you go in there, they, they slap you with another tax for your rifle. 100 bucks here, 200 bucks there. Next thing you know, you're talking coffee money. <laughs> So you know, a lot of guys will try to get by with one, and the 375 is a good option. But I think you need to have a different bullet selection. You might want that 300 grain for your buffalo hunt, but then for the oryx and the kudu and the zebra and the warthogs and all the rest of the plains game that you're going to hunt, you might want to look at a 270 grain bullet or a 250 grain bullet. Something that is going to expand better than, say, an A-frame or a Barnes X or any of the controlled expansion bullets that are designed for deep, deep penetration. You don't necessarily want that. And I think that's where I may have gotten in trouble. For instance, on my blue wildebeest, the blue wildebeest is a large, strong, stout animal. And I watched my friend Dean shoot one high on the shoulder with a 375 and drop it right there like he had spined it. And he probably did. I took the same shot on mine and it's still running. <laughs> and uh, it looked like it was a perfect shot straight up on the shoulder, a little bit high, like I should have just killed him with that high shoulder shot. He acted like I'd missed him. In fact, I thought I did because the bullet kicked up dust behind him and I thought I'd shot over him, but then we could see red on its shoulder. And we tracked that thing all day and never found it. So that was one of the reasons I wasn't too excited about that 375. So you can read my old blog on this, and I think you'd be a little surprised. It's not just me, and I'm a bad shot. A lot of guys wrote in and said, you know, it's the shooter. It's not the gun. There's nothing wrong with the 375, and they lambasted me for being a bad shot. You know, and some of that may be legit. But boy, some of these other ones that I photographed and or filmed, those were perfect shots in the boiler room. And the results were what I reported. You know, like that warthog just taking off running until it ran out of gas. No big surprise there, but a lot of the 375 H and H fans would say that should have hammered him and anchored him right where he stood. And it certainly didn't. Nor did it do it to that little reed buck and a lot of other animals over the years. So I'd uh, encourage you to read that article and maybe chime in on it. I think the guys who suggested my bullets were too hard for the velocities are probably on it. That's where I think the 270 grain and lighter bullets might have been the ticket. And uh, the way that 375 took my wife's buffalo out was really impressive. And she didn't even hit the spine. It went down. I don't understand why she did not break the shoulder. She went high in the shoulder and hit the scapula. And then to the other side, threw that one, and it was against the skin on the back side. Um, but for some reason, that buffalo couldn't get up. And you know how famous buffalo are for being tough <laughs> and charging. We were expecting this thing to leap up and run its horns through us all, and it didn't. And we just eased up to it, and she put another one right here as it lay on its side. And, of course, that was the heart-lung area, and that did him in. But, boy, that first bullet, all it did was go through the lungs and the shoulders. Now, there's this this argument about the solar plexus, it's a bundle of nerves. It's kind of the central nervous system where it comes down off the brain and the spinal column where the nerves all come out. And there's an area underneath the spine there, high on the shoulders, that branches off to various parts of the body for the nerves. I don't fully understand it, but it's called popularly the solar plexus, I believe. Uh, maybe some doctors out there could give us a little more detail on that. But the argument is that that might be what we're hitting when we make these high shoulder shots that miss the spine, but still put the animal down and either paralyze it or kill it instantly. At any rate, those are the things that can happen with pretty much any cartridge and any bullet. I guess what I'm trying to say then about the 375 H&H, &H, 
is that, yes, it is a great all-round cartridge. Why wouldn't it be? You know, it's just, as I told one guy, we're just throwing glorified rocks with these cartridges. And if you throw the right rock at the right velocity to break down the vital tissues of the animal, that's what's going to do the job. So why wouldn't the 375 work? Unless at 2,500, 2,550 feet per second, some of these harder rocks that we're throwing don't expand enough to damage enough tissue to really have them hemorrhage quickly enough. I think that's probably what's going on. But I really was surprised at how close that 338 Winchester Magnum comes to the performance of the 375 in a shorter case. Now, I forgot to look up the allowed pressures, but I'll bet you that's what's doing it. I'm thinking that 338 Win Mag has probably got a SAMI spec maximum average chamber pressure of 64,000 or at least 61,000 PSI. And I'll bet the old 375 H&H is down there closer to 55,000. I will have to look that up and put the numbers on the screen here for you guys. But that might be one of the reasons we're not getting as much velocity as I think we should out of this longer case. Uh, something we'll look to look into. At any rate, if you are looking for a good mid-range caliber, bigger than the 30, smaller than the 40s, the 416s, the 458s, and all those big horses, you, these are the ones you want to consider. Uh, I think a 338 or the 37, somewhere in that category. But remember, that includes the 35 calibers, and probably we could pull in something that I had dragged in here early and put in the wrong place. Wow, a few guys have been asking me about this one. We're going to have to do a video on this someday, and probably fairly soon. It's an eight millimeter Remington Magnum. And as you can see, it's as tall as the 375. It's a belted case. Yep, it's a full length Magnum, neck down to take a 0.323 inch diameter bullet. That's another program worth investigating. So we will look at the eight millimeter Remington Magnum someday and maybe the 358 Norma Magnum and some of the other 35s. And of course, if you're looking at the 338s, even though the Win Mag is kind of the most famous and I think a well balanced one, you've got a lot more now. You got the Lapua, the Ultra Mag from Remington. Um, I can't remember all the rest of them, but there are some big 338s out there. So if you're looking for a lot of horsepower in a bigger cartridge, you've got a lot to pick from, a lot of research to do. But right now, if I were picking between these for an Alaskan hunt in which I might run into a grizzly or a brown bear, 338 Win Mag would be my baby over the 375 H&H. That's my take on it. Ron Spomer, right in and give me some of that incoming fire and I'll see if I can take the heat. I probably should have worn a, a football helmet or a motorcycle helmet for this one. Uh, thanks for watching, guys. We really appreciate the visit. We'll see you next time. Hunt honest and shoot straight. Mm -hmm.